let's get started. We've got Paul Rennie, CEO of Paradigm. Uh, Paul, I'm just going to hand it straight over to you. Uh, and you've got your shared screen all safe, safe and up. So uh, get started and, and I'll ask any questions just at the end. Uh, if they get submitted through the chat. Thanks very much. Okay, thanks, Simon. Uh, my understanding is that um, the presentation will take about 20 minutes, uh, leaving us about 10 minutes at the end for questions. So I'd like to welcome everyone to the presentation by Paradigm. And this is an updated presentation just to bring everyone up to speed with where we are with our clinical development programs. I'd like to thank everyone for attending. And um, given the short time available for the presentation, I will be flicking through some slides. Um, and in some cases, just leaving the slides for you to read at your leisure, we will be putting the presentation up on our website after uh, we've gone through this presentation. Now, in terms of Paradigm's mission, um, again, that's there for you to read. I just wanted to um, highlight that Paradigm's aim is to develop and commercialise an ethical, safe and effective pharmaceutical agent, of course, the Benet's PPS, for the treatment of musculoskeletal disorders in humans with degenerative disease driven by injury and alpha virus infection, aging or genetic predisposition, as in the case of MPS. Uh, in terms of um, the COVID-19 update, I think the, the take home message here is that um, Paradigm has, since its inception, worked as a remote organisation. So we are well and truly geared up to be able to have all of our staff working from home. We have the systems in place to continue our business as usual. So we don't see COVID-19 as uh, representing a major uh, barrier to our business uh, and in terms of our business model. So all of our staff have been working from home for the last three weeks and doing an excellent job. And we don't see that any of the, um, the shutdowns being overly impactful on our business. Uh, one of the areas that we are currently working on very closely with our suppliers is the shipment of the um, pharmaceutical product from country to country, given that some of the countries may be imposing bans on goods being shipped. We're currently um, shipping a lot of our, our product to the United States, to Canada, to Australia, to other areas where we need it for various purposes. Um, I'd like to um, thank all of my staff who've been working diligently um, since we started the remote operation. Um, business has continued without a glitch and uh, I know that they are all very focused and working on tasks which we'll go through uh, in the presentation, but thank you to everyone for their support. Uh, in terms of executive summary, I think what I'd like to do is just touch on some of these points without going into great detail, but just to let you know, for those who haven't heard the Paradigm story, is um, Paradigm is repurposing the drug pentazan polysulfate sodium. Um, it is um, an FDA approved drug and it has a 60 year track record in terms of both safety and use in humans. Our lead program is osteoarthritis and in the United States we know that there are 31 million sufferers with clinically diagnosed osteoarthritis in the US alone. So a major market and I think one of the things to understand in terms of the biotech industry, there are two key drivers I think. Um, Drugs which address a significant unmet clinical need are generally recessionary proof. So if you have a drug and it's uh, addressing a particular ailment and it's working very well, then obviously um, downturn in the economy doesn't adversely affect the sales of that drug. Um, uh, part of our business right now is really to be working on um, the other aspect that I think is important in biotech is the generation of clinical data. Clinical data at the end of the day um, drives the success of a biotech company. So whether it be through a special access program or the expanded access program in the United States, or whether it be through clinical trials, gathering the human data is a very important part. And that data starts with submissions to the regulatory authorities followed up by the execution of the clinical trials. And we have staff that are working on both of those right now. The um, submission to the regulatory authorities is a very time consuming, a very exact um, piece of work that needs to be done. 
and that is being done for both Europe and the United States concurrently. And we also have clinical trials that are about to start in um, Australia, and we can go into that detail a little bit later. Um, in terms of um, our secondary program, that is the program for treating the rare disease of mucopolysaccharidosis, um, that is uh, again on track. Um, in terms of our, our product for these um, phase three trials, our product is finished, it is um, packed and ready to go. In fact, I'm not sure if you can see this on the video, but this is um, our phase three product, which is currently being shipped out to doctors who are using it in Australia and in the United States under the um, expanded access program or the special access program here in Australia. So we are generating um, data as we continue to build towards our, our pivotal phase three trials. The other thing I think uh, I'd like to mention about Paradigm is that we have, since our inception, always worked off a cash preservation mode. We've always um, tried to have a very low burn rate and we continue to do that without um, massive cost cuttings and things like that because we've always built in to our system uh, ways of being able to become more efficient and being very lean. So we currently have $73.6 million in the bank and we'll continue to preserve that until we get into the middle of our trials where our expenditure will increase. But right now we are well funded um, through the phase three clinical trial and beyond. In terms of upcoming milestones and news flow, I think the, um, the first one which I'd like to just mention is the um, minutes from the US FDA meeting. They are expected to be with us uh, relatively shortly. It's over a month ago since we had our meeting with the FDA, the 19th of February, and we expect those, those minutes to be sent to us, um, but we do understand that there are some holdups with the agency at the moment. But um, once those minutes um, arrive, we will be um, making uh, a, an ASX announcement with the details of that meeting. I have said previously that I thought the meeting was very positive and informative. By positive, I think what it showed me particularly was the great strength in having the Benet product uh, as a cornerstone to all of our clinical development. My take from the FDA meeting, not that it's um, uh, necessarily going to be said this way in the minutes, but my take is that it's going to be almost impossible for another company to produce a uh, penazan polysulfate product that will be acceptable to the United States FDA. The, the reason for that is that um, the FDA is well and truly familiar with the Bene product. They understand the molecule, and they also understand the molecule has molecules within the molecule. And those molecules within the molecule are called moieties, and the agency made us aware that there were particular moieties that uh, concern them, um, because some of those moieties have uh, adverse effects on safety or efficacy. And uh, Benner has done an excellent job in controlling those moieties and producing a very consistent product. So the molecule is almost identical batch to batch and the moieties are in very small and reduced levels from batch to batch. So in terms of talking to the, um, the FDA, it seems like there's going to be a tremendous uh, advantage for Paradigm in exclusively using the Benet material. Um, moving on to the uh, first dot point, um, the compassionate use program uh, with the NFL, um, the Pro Players Elite Network we're working with. Um, we did mention that uh, we had our first patient dosed. Um, this week we announced that all patients, um, that's all 10 of the ex-NFL players are now dosed and we will be expecting to release those results Q3 calendar year 2020. Importantly, we are going to be presenting those results with the same sort of uh, tools that we expect to be using for measuring pain reduction in our phase three clinical trial. So while this is not a trial and it is uh, real world evidence, we are gathering data and getting doctors to collect, for example, the WOMAC pain scores, which we will be um, announcing in Q3. And those WOMAC uh, scoring systems will be used in our phase three clinical trial. 
We are also working with the, um, the FDA for uh, submission for our IND opening study. Uh, we expect to make that submission to the FDA in Q4 2020. So the meeting I mentioned was um, positive in, in terms of the, uh, the, the real important uh, uh, concept from the FDA that only the Bene material is one that they understand and uh, would, would be recommending for going forward with into a clinical trial, but also was the certainty that came with the FDA from our meeting. We asked a number of questions and those questions were answered very clearly from the agency and so we believe now we have certainty for our program going forward into IND but also the agency gave us some very important instructions in terms of the next stage which is the uh, the NDA which is the step prior to registration so we think we have a very clear roadmap now to not only IND but also to NDA which is very very uh, informative for us. Um, we, uh, in terms of the pivotal study for MPS, um, we are uh, we have a joint parallel scientific advice submission to the FDA and EMA, which will occur in the coming months. This is to get consistency in terms of protocol design between the FDA and EMA, because this being a rare disease, will be um, conducted in both Europe and the United States at the same time. Um, so if we get agreement on that, we'll have one protocol, but we'll be then able to roll that out in both the um, US and Europe at the same time. The, um, the TGA Compassionate Use um, SAS program continues. Um, we currently have doctors who are um, treating somewhere in the region of uh, 40 patients a month. So we will be announcing shortly around the first 35 patients who have been treated with our phase three clinical trial product, um, which is this uh, product here. Um, and they have had their clinical outcomes measured in the same way as we'll be measuring the clinical outcomes in the phase three trial. So those data, again, while it's not a trial, um, will give people some insight in terms of how the product is performing um, in terms of both safety and efficacy in patients with osteoarthritis ahead of the phase three clinical trial. Um, we expect to um, announce it in, in the short term, the first 35 of those subjects uh, and their results. And then I think probably in Q3, we'll have somewhere in the region of between 100 and 200 results that we'll be able to make uh, the market aware of. Um, in terms of additional news flow, we continue to work with some um, experts in Europe on the assessment of the respiratory indication, whether we're going for a, a topical administration or a um, administration direct to the lungs. That's uh, still work that's underway. And we're also working on um, peer review publication for the write-up of our phase 2B osteoarthritis um, study and also the uh, write-up and peer review of our phase 2A viral arthritis clinical trial. That's the Ross River trial, which had some very impressive results, not only clinical um, and patient assessed uh, pain outcomes, but also some very good objective data in terms of the hand grip strength and, and others. That's, that's going to be a very exciting publication. Um, moving on to calendar year 2021, um, a phase 3 OA clinical trial um, we expect to also be in clinical trial with the MPS. Um, we hope to have uh, Xylosol launched in Australia under the, the TGA provisional approval. And uh, we'll also um, hopefully have some uh, uh, approval from the TGA and other agencies for the use of PPS for treating uh, viral arthritis as a, as a result of the alpha virus infection. Um, now, pentazan polysulfate, as I mentioned, um, just to note here, um, the oral form of the drug Elmuron, which is marketed by Janssen Pharmaceuticals for the treatment of the bladder condition interstitial cystitis, the patent for the use of PPS or Elmuron for treatment of interstitial cystitis expired in 2010. And since that time, there has been no generic alternative for the oral version of the drug approved in the United States. 
And I think after our meeting with the United States um, FDA, it now becomes very clear why that's the case. In fact, it's almost impossible for another company to produce the identical product to Bene Pharma and therefore have the sorts of requirements that the agency requires to ensure safety and efficacy of the product. So we're very um, proud that we have uh, for a number of years now um, been promoting the fact that we have an exclusive supply with Bene Pharma. So we buy the raw material from Bene Pharma and then Paradigm um, prepares and packs the final product, um, which is the um, PPS in solution ready for injection. And as a result of that, we pay a 2% royalty on our net sales back to Bene Pharma and in return get exclusive supply. So it means for those indications such as uh, osteoarthritis or pain or viral arthritis where we have, Paradigm has filed patents, um, Bene has agreed to only and exclusively supply Paradigm with their FDA approved PPS product. So it puts us in a very unique position and it's almost the regulatory exclusivity and the uh, commercial exclusivity with Bene Pharma uh, as powerful as any patent protection, if not even more powerful than patent protection. So I, I hope that people understand that um, uh, Paradigm's in a very strong position here. And I also made mention in the last ASX announcement that we made, um, just bear in mind that all of the Paradigm patents always include the use of the drug uh, by all routes of, it, of administration. So that includes the injectable route, um, uh, also topical, but also oral. So if you see um, any suggestion that the, the oral product will replace the injectable product, um, that's not going to happen because uh, an oral product used in the indications where Paradigm has patents, of course, would be somebody else infringing our intellectual property rights. So we do have um, strong patents and IP position, and this is sit sitting over and above the protection that we have under the exclusive agreement with Bene Pharma and also the regulatory exclusivity that we have under the, um, the fact that this is a complex molecule with multiple moieties that make up the overall compound and the agency um, really requiring that the products be in exactly the same format. And that's why I don't think we've seen any generic alternative for the oral product in the United States since 20, 2010. So we do have um, a minimum life on our, our recent patents going out to 2035. Our most recent patent, which was the, the patent around the um, role of PPS and its ability to downregulate the nerve growth factor and therefore the reduction in chronic pain. So a chronic pain patent um, goes out to 2040. So as I mentioned, our business at the moment is about generating clinical data. Um, so we're running the EAP program in the United States. We're running the special access program in Australia, generating real world evidence. At the same time, um, we also are working on a lot of submissions to the various agencies. So we know that there's the TGA provisional approval. Um, we've had our first meeting with the TGA, which occurred 11th of November last year. And that was a knockout meeting where the TGA agreed with our submission that there was um, an unmet medical need for the treatment of chronic pain, particularly in osteoarthritis, and that the current medications um, didn't, didn't offer the sort of relief that um, we've been able to show in our phase two data. So we continue to proceed with our provisional um, approval process. Uh, we have stage two coming up, which we expect to occur in Q4 2020. Um, the extended, uh, expanded access program in the United States, um, I think people now know that we have um, commenced treatment of all 10 subjects in the United States, and um, we expect results to be reported in Q3 2020. So again, just bear in mind that that is um, are going to be um, uh, reporting on the WOMAC pain scale. And the FDA investigational new drug, the IND, uh, we expect to make our submission in Q4 2020. And I'm starting to run out of time, so I'm just going to fly through some of these slides very quickly. Um, I've mentioned the special access scheme. We will have um, 
uh, a number of patients who've been treated with the phase three uh, product, which is uh, the product that we currently have in, in our warehouse, that will be um, supplied to doctors to treat their patients. They'll be gathering the data using the um, WOMAC pain scoring system. It's a self-administered questionnaire um, consisting of 24 items. Um, so again, this is something that people can read if they're interested in, in the, um, the way the WOMAC pain score system works. This slide um, was put up to show that um, the first four questions under coups are, are questions that are quite specific to the, um, the knee outcome scoring system developed by Dr. Coos. And as you'll see, the last four or five questions are basically the WOMAC pain questionnaire. So when we score the pain through Coos, we're picking up both the Coos questions as well as the WOMAC questions. So we have been able to go back through our data in a post hoc manner and look at the responses and determine that the um, WOMAC questions really uh, expanded our understanding in terms of how our drug works and we saw a very significant um, drug effect size in these um, five questions, which is one of the reasons why we're moving to WOMAC as well as um, WOMAC being recognised by a lot of the US pharma companies for our phase three clinical trial design. Um, we have published our mechanism of action, which was very important and um, the um, agency was very impressed with this work. Um, we have also published on the right hand side of this slide um, our data which showed that there were significant um, cartilage uh, uh, preservation effects going on with those people treated with the drug. So showing that in the blue histogram, the patients uh, treated with PPS, uh, their comp levels were going down nearly 12% while their um, placebo colleagues were going up by 2.1% and the um, Adams TS5 uh, going down 5% by the PPS group and up 10% in the placebo group, indicating that um, there was less active cartilage breakdown going on in the people who got the, the PPS. Um, we also showed that um, there was um, a significant reduction in the bone marrow edema volume, size and grade. And this is a grade three with the red boundary, grade three bone marrow lesion. And after PPS, that blue boundary is the same lesion, but now reduced in its grade, going from a grade three, which is um, the highest grade of a bone marrow lesion, going down to a grade two. And I think most uh, orthopedic surgeons, most uh, sports physicians or even primary care physicians would say it's very unlikely to see a lesion reducing in size once the lesion is in place. We know that um, through work with um, one of our major consultants, um, Professor David Felsen, who's published a lot in this area, says that um, large lesions generally get um, larger in size over time. They generally don't get smaller, but he also says the lesions are associated with increased pain increased cartilage loss, high risk of joint destruction, and a high risk of total knee replacement. A lot of that work has been done by Flavia Secatini in Australia. Um, so therefore, reduced lesions lead to reduced pain, reduced cartilage loss, reduced risk of joint destruction, and reduced risk of total knee replacement, which is entirely consistent with the biomarker data that I showed you before. And it's also entirely consistent with the symptomatic improvements that we saw with the patients um, in the drug. So uh, we have, shown this previously, um, the red line being the placebo, the blue line being the PPS treatment group, uh, showing that um, the patients on the, the treated uh, group, the PPS group, um, showing a clinically meaningful result out to day 165. So we have shown symptomatic uh, correlation with the bone marrow lesion data and the biomarker data we also saw um, significant improvement in the activities of daily living. Uh, clinically meaningful results um, shown in the bottom left hand side. And this is the collective of all of the um, patients in this cohort showed a minus 38% reduction in the total volume 
uh, of the knee joint uh, reduction in the lesion, whereas placebo going up nearly 30%, and the medial compartment going minus 40%, and the placebo going up 25%. So um, very nice data for us to be able to analyze, go back and look at all the signals and prepare for our phase three data. And we showed all of these data to the US FDA and they were, I think, quite impressed with the durability of the drug and really had a question in relation to how long does this effect go for? Paul, I might just um, jump in there, if you don't mind, just to try and answer a couple of these questions, just because we're running out of time. Yeah, sure. Um, I'll just uh, flip through these yep, and see if there's anything else that's very important to no mention. Uh, just on, on this particular slide, looking at our cash inflow um, being driven by um, uh, bank interest and also the um, R&D uh, tax offset uh, outflows being very conservative, I think, for a biotech company, um, indicating that our cash preservation model is in, already in place. Um, and then there's a few slides there in the appendix. So I, I can take some questions now if that helps. Great, that'd be great. Uh, regarding slide nine, in relation to the TGA provisional approval, as previously announced, there was a chance for TGA approval and paradigm generating income possibly in third quarter. Do we assume now that that's unlikely as a TGA submission won't occur until Q4? Please elaborate on the TGA approval timeline and likely approval timeline for Australia until generating income occurs. Yeah, uh, that, that's a fair point. I think um, we had expected uh, potential revenue um, in Q3 2020, um, but given the, uh, the feedback and the process with the TGA, we realised that the next submission is the critical one for us and one for us to be able to answer all the questions from our first meeting uh, thoroughly and conclusively with the supporting data. Otherwise, we will get knocked out and uh, therefore that opportunity to generate revenue through the provisional approval process will in fact be delayed even further. So yes, we push that back to Q4, um, but we'll give the market regular updates as we move forward um, through that process, but um, it's, it's a fair point. And hi, Paul, are you able to expand on the potential use of PPS for chronic pain in conditions other than OA? Thanks. Yes, yeah, so um, the, uh, the pattern that we have filed, we have filed a number of patterns around pain. Um, and certainly what we know from the work that's been done by uh, Dr. Ravi Krishnan, who's our Chief Scientific Officer, has identified that it's the bone cells that produce the NGF and those uh, bone cells are the, the ones that um, are responsible for the, the chronic pain and, and the overexpression of NGF leading to chronic pain. We know that occurs in other joints as well, so therefore the same mechanism that PPS uses to downregulate NGF will apply to all the other joints, such as uh, the hands, hips, knees, ankles, etc. cetera. Um, we do also have some patterns around the use of um, PPS for post-operative pain and other chronic pain. Uh, we are start, uh, intend to start a small um, study in uh, another indication which uh, is predominantly a chronic pain indication. So we'll continue to develop that up. But I think the management of pain is a very important uh, aspect to our intellectual property. So it's not just um, osteoarthritis. That's a very good question. There are many other chronic diseases, but as always, um, rather than speculate and say that it will work in this indication or that indication, we always take the approach that we'd like to do a, a pilot study first. So first of all, go back and look at the scientific evidence and this um, overexpression of NGF uh, drives many um, of the, the chronic um, pain conditions. And therefore, if it works in osteoarthritis, there's a very likely, a strong likelihood it would work in other indications. But having said that, um, we would like to obviously always do a small study, um, either um, a large animal or even better in humans, and, and look at the, um, the use of the drug in that specific condition and then publish that, that data and file patents, et cetera. 
but yes, it's definitely on our agenda because I think chronic pain and the management thereof is a major unmet medical need, particularly in the light of um, you know the opioid uh, overuse, and also as we get older and um, we try and maintain our, 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 our fitness, our chronic pain interrupts that uh, and interrupts our life cycle, um, our lifestyle. Um, but also, I think chronic pain is a major driver to many other morbidities. Um, we know that uh, chronic pain leads to um, uh, problems with people sleeping. Um, uh, nighttime pain is, is a real concern for a lot of uh, patients and, and physicians in terms of how can we get um, a product that works to reduce the nighttime pain. Um, and of course, chronic pain then uh, really is a major reason why a lot of people don't continue to exercise and therefore put on weight. Um, so it is a bit of a vicious cycle, but um, chronic pain treatment of is a very key focus for Paradigm. But thank you for the question. Great, I think uh, we're unfortunately have to finish it there. There's a number of questions that we haven't answered, um, which I'll come back on the email, uh, CCing Paul individually. Um, if there's any more questions uh, of Paul, um, you've got, We've all got my email or Matt's, um, so we can well and truly facilitate that. But uh, Paul, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, it was a seriously comprehensive presentation. There's a lot to get through, so thanks uh, for making the effort. We really appreciate it. Well, thank you, Simon. Thank you, Alex. And of course, thank you, everyone who dialed in. Um, and uh, I think uh, those people who are investors have Simon White's contact details or my details. So, yeah, if they have any uh, questions, please let us know. We're, we're more than happy to help. Thank you very much, everyone. Awesome. Thanks, Paul. Cheers.